Hey guys, I'm Sun, I'm a privacy and a security researcher and you're watching The Privacy Guides. In last episode, I explained why email is shitty for privacy, uh, mostly because it lacks end-to-end -end encryption and identity verification. That means that when you send an email to someone, that email will uh, lie on the server of your provider and on the server of the recipient's provider, unencrypted, ready to be uh, eavesdropped by the provider, a partner, or anyone with a subpoena. Uh, now, there is a way to mitigate that, and that's true using PGP. PGP stands for Pretty Good Privacy. It's an encryption app that is used to encrypt, sign, and decrypt messages or files. And I guess you guys know about ProtonMail. Well, ProtonMail is actually uh, using PGP through OpenPGPGS, which is a JavaScript implementation of PGP. So what ProtonMail has done is democratized and made convenient uh, the process of encrypting messages to and from users that have ProtonMail. Now, uh, all of this uh, convenience layer stuff, that's amazing to make it like mass adoptable. But in today's episode, I'm gonna show you how to do this using the command line. I don't send many emails because I consider email public domain. Even with PGP, email is not perfect. Why? Because PGP has two major flaws. Flaw number one is uh, when you're sending an email with a PGP encrypted payload, well, the to and from addresses are leaked. That cannot be uh, encrypted because it's part of the email protocol. The second big drawback is PGP does not uh, implement forward secrecy. What that means is say we're communicating using PGP and email, and someone intercepts one of those emails through a subpoena or whatever, well, that person could start attempting a brute force attack against the encryption that we have going on. And as soon as, they are, uh, as soon as they're capable of breaking one message, well, they now have the key to unlock all of our past and future messages. That's something that isn't the case with Signal. And if you haven't watched the episodes on Signal, I'll link it up here or in the description. Uh, Signal solves that through implementing forward secrecy. Um, that being said, sometimes you just want to be able to receive emails from someone you don't know, and that doesn't really work well on Signal. So the cool thing with PGP is you can pop your public key on your website or anywhere else. You can also share it on a key server, and then people can just use that to encrypt a message that only you can decipher. And that is amazing. It's a great tool. And without further ado, let's let's jump in. Um, so as I mentioned in uh, my last behind the scenes episode, I've been migrating all of the, uh, uh, what's what did I call this? Let me see here. Do, do, do. I've been migrating all of the reference material to my website before I used to publish stuff there and then sometimes on Gist. I just made things really accessible by putting them all in one place. And that's where we have the command line stuff that we're gonna be running today. So let's put that window a little smaller and pop open a terminal. What we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be installing Homebrew. Homebrew is a package manager that allows you to install open source projects on your Mac really easily. Uh, on Debian, for instance, which is a Linux distribution, you have APT, and APT is also a package uh, manager, so thankfully there's one for our Mac. Uh, now, by default, uh, it wants us, let's just go on the website here, by default, it wants us to just run that command. And what that means is you're essentially running a command with pseudo privileges, which means with administrative privileges, and we have no clue what's going on here. So uh, I always recommend auditing you know scripts like that to kind of make sense of what they're doing and that's what we're going to do here we won't do a really deep dive audit because we don't have time and it's not really the purpose of today's episode but let's do a quick one just to start uh you know putting that in our muscle memory so we always don't forget about this uh so what i'm going to be doing here i'm going to go on the desktop using the cd command and i'm going to run curl uh, capital o and then i'm pasting that thing and what that's doing is it's essentially downloading it to my desktop. I can then use Visual Studio Code's code command to open it. So this means I can open the install script. And once this is done, well, we can go about looking at the source code. And I won't do a full audit, as I mentioned, I did it before suggesting you guys should 
run this, but essentially what it's doing is it's cloning a GitHub repository with Brew and it's doing a little bit of stuff behind the scenes to make sure that your Mac is ready for open source stuff on Brew. So as I mentioned, key takeaway here is you should always have a look at the source code uh, if you're concerned about you know security and privacy. Uh, but for th for the sake of this uh, episode, we're gonna you know say that this is all legit, so I can clear my console and run this. Now it's asking me for my administrative password, as I mentioned earlier. I'm gonna write it. As you guys know by now, I have a shitty password for this demo computer, but yours should be much longer. Uh, okay, so this is a whole bunch of directory or folders that are gonna be created. So press enter and it's gonna download Homebrew. So now while this is happening, cause that's gonna take a little bit of time, uh, I need to kind of fill that airtime. So I'm gonna start talking about the, oh, actually, let me see. Oh, wow, so that was cool. Um, yeah, so it's already installed, uh, was able to, uh, yeah, okay, so Homebrew, so this is faster because I actually downloaded it once before, uh, so that's great. That makes it way easier for us today. Cool, okay, so uh, what's happening here is Homebrew has been installed and by default, Homebrew enables uh, anonymous aggregate formula and cask analytics, so that means that there's some telemetry going on and we prefer disabling that because the whole purpose of this series is to be as private as possible. So that's super easy. You can use brew analytics off enter and we're done. By the way, you may have noticed here that the computer name uh, I have changes all the time. If you haven't seen the episode on how to spoof your computer name and your Mac address, I'll link it up here and in the description. It's a pretty cool hack. Uh, okay, moving on. Now that we have brew installed on a computer, we can install GNUPG. So GNUPG is an open source implementation of PGP that is super easy to run on Linux and Unix based systems and Mac being Unix. Well, we can really easily install this. So all we have to do is run brew install GNUPG, enter, and it will do its thing. Now, uh, hopefully this will be a little faster as well. Yes, that is so great. So since I installed this already before, uh, you know, recording this take, I was rehearsing for this, it's installed. Perfect. Now we want to create our key pair. PGP is uh, what we call an asymmetric encryption system. It uses public keys and private keys to encrypt messages, you know, destined to someone. So when I want to encrypt a message for you, for instance, I'm going to download your public key and I'm going to use it to encrypt a message that only you can decipher and I'm gonna sign that message with my private key. Therefore, you can be absolutely sure that I was the person who sent it, uh, unless someone has physical access to my computer or forces me to do so, uh, which is OPSEC, by the way. If you haven't watched the episode on InfoSec versus OPSEC, I'll link it up here and I'll put it in the description. Uh, okay, so we need to start by creating our public key and our private key, and that's done by running this little command here. Once this is done, uh, oh, actually, yeah, so uh, your selection. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, maybe I didn't mention this, but I'll do here. Uh, this is a beginner's guide. There are ways to make uh, this stuff way more hardened. That will be the subject of a future episode. So if you're new to the channel, smash that subscribe button and we'll get there. For the time being, we're kind of going to go with the flow and, and use mostly defaults. Uh, so we're going to go about creating an RSA uh, key here. Now, um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so we want to set the key size to uh, 4,096, uh, sorry. That makes it harder to brute force. And we're not going to make our key expire. Uh, okay, so this is correct. Yes. Now we need to construct our user ID. This is something that could be pseudonymous, but keep in mind that that's what people are going to look at when they want to verify if you actually signed a message. And when someone searches for you on a key server, uh, which is kind of like an abstract concept, but see it as an address book that's up there in the cloud. If someone needs your public key to encrypt a message for you, well, they're gonna search for you and they're gonna do that using probably your email address. So you wanna have something that you know is linked to your real identity. So here, my real identity on this computer is John Doe and my email address is john at example.net. Okay, no comment and okay. 
Good. Now it's time to choose a passphrase. That passphrase is really critical. If you use a shitty passphrase, someone could, you know, steal your computer, brute force your passphrase and impersonate you. So you really want to make sure that that passphrase is as secure as your password manager's passphrase. I recommend using a passphrase of six words, some of which do not exist in a dictionary that will make that password very long, over 28 characters long, and not brute forceable using, uh, or, or hackable, I should have said, using a dictionary attack. Uh, by the way, I've discussed stuff about passwords in the episode on configuring MacPass. I'll link it up here and in the description. All right, so for the purpose of this, I'm gonna put a super shitty password, actually so shitty that it is actually telling me it's shitty, but you know what, you guys are seeing this so again, your passphrase should be way, way, way longer than this. All right, so what it's doing here now, it's using entropy and it's uh, creating that key pair to make it as random as possible. And once it's done, cool, it's done. So what we can do next is uh, we can add uh, openpgp.org as our default key server. And that's important because some key servers are shittier than others. Most privacy researchers uh, suggest using that one. Now that this is done, uh, we wanna extract our public key because that's what we're gonna be sharing. So in the context of this, I'm John, so I'm gonna be publishing that key uh, on my website, for instance. So if I go about uh, you know, showing the content of my john.asc, uh, by the way, .asc is the extension for uh, uh, armored uh, public keys. This is my public key. So as you can see, this is a bunch of gibberish, but cryptographically speaking, that's what people will use to encrypt messages that only you can decipher using your private key. Now the private key is on your file system and it's encrypted, use it your, it's encrypted using your passphrase. So that's pretty neat. So we never really need to access it, uh, you know, automatically, uh, like we've done here with John, uh, not automatically, Jesus, we don't need to access it. Uh, it's kind of happening there behind the scenes. Uh, now uh, let's import my public key. So my real public key, son's public key. So we're gonna start by doing that using a key server. And as we can see, it's being imported and we can also go about importing it from my website, but that's the same key. So, you know, it's gonna say unchanged one. What that means here is if I type uh, GPG and then uh, K and I put my email, Boom, I can see that the key is in my key ring. Uh, next stage is we absolutely wanna confirm if that key is legitimate. Someone could have uploaded a fake key pretending they're me with my email to a key server. I mean, I won't get into the security details here. That means the person would have compromised my email if the key server is well implemented. But nonetheless, we wanna make sure that that key is mine. And we do that using something called a cryptographic fingerprint. So when we're looking at the fingerprint for hello at sanutsin.com, this here is the fingerprint. And as I mentioned here, if you go on my website, well, at the bottom here in the footer is the key. So uh, the fingerprint, sorry. So if I take this and I do a search, boom, we have a match. Uh, then I also uploaded it to GitHub. Someone could potentially compromise my website. So now that it's on GitHub, if I do a search, boom, we have a match. And I also put it on my YouTube about page. And if we do a search, boom, we have a match. That means that for someone to compromise my cryptographic identity, well, that person would have to hack my website, GitHub and YouTube. And that's very unlikely. Another way to make sure that a key is actually legitimate is signing someone's key, building what we call a web of trust. That will be the subject for a future episode. All right, back to the tutorial here. Now that we've done that and we know that the key for hello at sanutsen.com is actually mine, well, let's go about encrypting a message to uh, Sun, for Sun. I mean, I'm John, this is very confusing here, but okay, I'm sure you get the point. If we run this command here, what this is doing, it's encrypting and it's signing and it's, uh, you know, armor means it's, it's gonna create an output that's email compatible essentially and it's gonna create this encrypted file as encrypted.asc on the desktop. And the R means do it for recipient John, an example, and do it for recipient hello at Sanutsen. You may be wondering why I'm encrypting this 
for myself and Sun. Well, the reason is if I encrypt the thing only for Sun, I won't be able to decrypt it to make sure that uh, I can reaccess that content. So in the same way, you can look at an email in your sent folder and see what's in it. Well, you would like to probably make sure that you can see what you just sent to someone. So typing enter will ask us, well, okay, it's not certain that the key belongs to the person named in the user ID. If you really know what you're doing, blah, 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 type yes. But we just uh, checked on a whole bunch of websites to make sure that that key was actually sans key. So that's cool. Enter. And then we can start writing or copy pasting in it. So for sake of, uh, you know, this example will keep things very, very simple. This is a test. And then we put an enter and then we type control D on the keyboard and it's going to ask us for our passphrase. So again, I used a really shitty one. Yours should be really elaborate, six words, uh, as complicated as your password managers. Enter, boom, it's done. We now have an encrypted.asc file on the desktop. So next up, how can we decrypt that? So I have this little command line here, which will decrypt the encrypted.asc file on the desktop. And <coughs> sorry, and it will also run it through uh, a decoder, which will decode quoted printable. This is email related stuff. You can look it up on uh, DuckDuckGo if you're interested. I was gonna say Google, old habits. Um, okay, so what's happening here when I paste this? Well, boom, it didn't ask me for my passphrase because it keeps it in cache. You make sure that when you do a bunch of encryption and decryption and signing operations, they can all run without human interference. But that's also kind of a security problem. So as we can see here, the message that we encrypted was now decrypted and the cycle is done. Once we're done and we want to make sure that someone cannot have access to our key to encrypt or sign something, we run this command and that will clear it out of the system. And now everything is back uh, where it was. Next time you try encrypting or signing something, it will ask you for your passphrase. Okay. The reason why I showed all of this to you guys, as I mentioned in uh, my last episode, is some of you have started sending emails to me. And as I said, that's totally cool if it's private, but if you're asking a more, uh, you know, uh, a less sensitive question, I really recommend you ask it on the channel. A bunch of people are starting to answer each other's questions and that's amazing. We're building this community together. So might as well tap into everyone's brains instead of just mine. So if you are sending something to me that is private, please use my public key to encrypt the message using the test we just did here. And if you don't have someone with who you can experiment with, well, you can just send me a message for fun and I'll answer back just so you can try things out and see if you know, you're able to encrypt a message and decrypt the one that I'm gonna send to you. All right, so that's all I have for you today. I hope this was insightful. If you're new to the channel and haven't subscribed yet, smash that subscribe button and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.